Welcome to the second part of lecture five of the course Experimental Vibration Analysis. In this video, we discuss the main tool used for spectrum analysis in practice, the discrete Fourier transform or the DFT. The content of this lecture is found in chapter nine of the book, Noise and Vibration Analysis. Here is an overview of the content of this video. We will first talk about some fundamental principles of spectrum analysis. Then we will go into some detail with the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform. And some of the things we will cover is the uh, periodicity of the DFT. We will cover leakage, which is an error effect caused by the DFT. Then we will talk about time windows, which is a way of reducing the leakage effects. We will talk about zero padding uh, and cyclic convolution. So let's start with understanding some fundamental facts about spectrum analysis. First of all, there are two types of frequency analysis methods. Parametric methods are methods that depend on some a priori information about the spectrum. For example, it could be that you know that the spectrum is discrete and that it has five harmonic components. Such methods are very common in signal processing and are very powerful. However, they generally do not work for vibration signals. So usually we have to rely on the non-parametric methods. These methods uh, are methods for which you do not need to know anything a priori. And examples of non-parametric methods for spectrum estimation are, for example, the octave spectra that we have talked about before in this course, then FFT-based methods that we'll discuss today, uh, and then wavelet methods, which are very common and, and quite popular today, uh, although we will not cover these as they don't really add anything that you cannot obtain with octave or FFT-based methods. Now here is a very, very important slide. It can be shown that all non-parametric spectrum analysis methods no matter how they are implemented, must act equivalently with the principle shown here. First, you bandpass filter your data using a particular center frequency and a particular bandwidth. The bandpass filter data is then passed to an RMS estimator, reading out the value of the bandpass data. To obtain the entire spectrum, you then need to step through all the frequencies that you want to know about. This, of course, requires a filter with a particular bandwidth. So a very important conclusion is you cannot know the spectrum content without limiting the knowledge to a particular frequency bandwidth or resolution. Also, there is a certain time it takes to compute the RMS level. And this time has to be related to the bandwidth of the filter. Another observation is that this principle is exactly what the old analog octave filter analyzers did, as indicated in the figure here. And this principle is also applicable to the interpretation of spectra obtained by DFT or FFT, or wavelets, or whatever fancy method you may found, find out there as long as the method is non-parametric. There is no other way unless you know something about the signal a priori. So having this in mind, we will now define the discrete Fourier transform. Since the DFT is the tool most often used for spectrum estimation, and because it has some very particular properties that leads to errors, that we need to understand when we measure vibrations. Then we will now present the DFT in quite some detail. I also strongly recommend you to go through all the examples in the book and in the chapter examples to ensure that you understand each aspect of the DFT that I present here. All the things we talk about here are things you will see when you do vibration analysis. So we start by the definition. 
the d of t x of k equals the sum n goes from 0 to n minus 1 of the values of x of n times e to minus j 2 pi k times n over uppercase n. And this is for k from goes from 0, 1 up to n minus 1. The uh, inverse transform x of n uh, you, uh, calculates x of n uh, in the, a similar manner. But note that there is a y, uh, 1 over n in front of the sum and that there is a positive exponent. In practice, we use the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, to compute the DFT. You can read about this in the book. This is important in a way, but I want to stress that the FFT simply computes the DFT in a fast manner. So it's still the DFT that we must understand. Therefore, I will continue to mention DFT here. But you should, of course, be aware that you should compute it by the FFT algorithm. Before going into the DFT details, I want to give a very elegant overview of the DFT that explains the very most part of it. This comes from an old Brilliant Care technical re review uh, written by Niels Trane in 1979. You recognize the first half approximately um, because we used this to explain the sampling theorem earlier on in the course. On the left hand side we have the time domain and on the right hand side we have the frequency domain. We start by sampling the, uh, the time data, which is equivalent to multiplying the time signal with the pulse train. The frequency result of this is a repetition of the spectrum at each integer of the sampling frequency, as we saw. The next step is that we must measure a limited amount of data. This corresponds to a multiplication of the full time signal by a rectangular box. And the frequency domain equivalent is to convolve the signal uh, spectrum, the true spectrum, with the Fourier transform of the box car. Now, this leads to some amplitude inaccuracy in the spectrum. This is actually the only cause of error there is in the DFT. And this error, which manifests itself in this amplitude uncertainty in the spectrum, is called leakage. And thus comes from the fact that we truncate the time signal, whereas the Fourier transform says that we need to know the signal from minus infinity to infinity, which of course we don't do in real life. The final thing here happens in the frequency domain because we sample the continuous spectrum here at the frequencies that we denote k. This, similarly to the sampling in the time domain, leads to a repetition in the time domain. So what we have in the end is that we have a spectrum which is not the spectrum of the measured signal, but it's the spectrum of the periodic repetition of the measured signal. Now we go back to the mathematical definition of the DFT. Hopefully we can demystify the maths behind it. First of all, the DFT result is not one sum, but actually two sums, since E to J angle is a cosine and J times a sine. So the DFT result, x of k, is actually one sum of the measured signal times cosines of different frequencies, depending on the k, minus j times the sum of the measured signal times sines of the same frequencies. Furthermore, the frequency k corresponds to k periods over the measurement time of the cosine and sine. So if k is 1, this cosine does one period from when 
the lowercase n goes from 0 to n minus 1. For k equals 2, this cosine makes two periods in the measurement time, and so on. So how does this work then? Well, it works through the orthogonality of sines and cosines that we talked about in one of the first lectures. If the signal contains the frequency indicated by k, then the sum of x and of n and that cosine or sine will be non-zero. Otherwise, if x of n does not contain that frequency, because of the orthogonality, the sum will be zero. Let us make a couple of observations of the DFT. Obviously, the zero value, x of zero, equals simply the sum of the signal. Also, x of n, if x of n is a cosine of a particular frequency coinciding with one of the frequencies, let's say k sub zero, then the DFT will come out with only two values, at k equals k sub zero and n minus k sub zero, and these values will be n half, because the mean value of a cosine squared, as we have here, the mean value of that is a half. There is no 1 over n in front of this, so this sum will be n half. And it will be 0 for all other frequency values. Thus, it's obvious that we should divide the DFT by the number of samples, n, in order to make it scaled. This will mean that the x0 value divided by n becomes the mean value of the signal and that a particular frequency component comes out with the actual amplitude or half since it's positive, uh, positive and negative uh, frequencies. We will see that soon. Now, this is actually only because we have defined the DFT the way we have. I mean, we could have defined the DFT with 1 over n in front of the sum. Now, many people do that, but I have chosen to define uh, the DFT the way MATLAB defines it, to avoid confusions. And this is probably the most common definition after all. Here's an example of the DFT of a cosine sampled with 16 samples, just to make it easy to see. So we have 16 samples and the cosine makes two periods exactly in the measurement time. In the lower plot, you see the DFT result divided by 16, the block size, as we call it. The zero frequency value first is zero because the signal has no mean. For frequency k equals one, we multiply x of n, the two period sign, with a co uh, cosine, with a cosine of one period. But because of the orthogonality, the sum of that product will be zero. The next frequency line, however, we multiply x of n by a cosine with two periods, which is exactly the same as the x of n signal. So there will be a sum result, and in this case of a half. And this occurs at k equals two and also at k equals 14, which is 16, the block size, minus 2. So we obtain two frequencies. Finally, we shall uh, interpret what the frequency k stands for. The first frequency line is a frequency of a sine or a cosine doing one period in the measurement time. Thus, that frequency corresponding to k equals 1 has to be 1 over t. And this can also be written as 1 over n times delta t. And since delta t is 1 over fs, this can also be written as fs divided by n. You should note especially that the length of the measurement time, t, is actually one more time st step than we have actually measured. And that is because the periodicity of this, when you repeat the 16 samples here, the first sample occurs here, where n is 16. And that is 
why the cosine indicated here is periodic in the time window, but it is actually periodic in one more time step than we have measured. This is a little awkward the first time you see the DFT, but you get used to it soon. Furthermore, you should see that k equals 8, that is half the block size, n half, compar compares to half the sampling frequency, because f is half is n times delta f half, and this means that k equals n half. The DFT is periodic in both time and frequency, as we saw. If we thus repeat what we had in the previous slide, we can see that what we obtain from k equals 8 to 15 in the previous slide, we can move down from minus 8 up to minus 1. The upper half of the DFT, then, that we got out of the DFT corresponds to the negative frequencies, as indicated in the plot here. Furthermore, x of k is often called frequency bin number k. And here are some other properties that follow straightforwardly. First of all, the real part of the DFT is the Fourier transform of the even part of the measured signal x of n. And this, the real part of the DFT, is even. So the real part of x of minus k equals the real part of x of k. Furthermore, the imaginary part of the DFT comes from the odd part of the measured signal x of n and is itself odd. So the imaginary part of x of minus k equals minus the imaginary part of x of plus k. It's also easy to see that the value of the DFT at half the block size, half the sampling frequency as we saw, x of n half, is a real value since it's equal to this time signal times minus 1 to n. This together with the symmetry means that if we store n half plus 1 values, so we store from k equals 0 up to n half, we will have enough values to be able to reconstruct the negative frequencies. But we need to store also this real valued half sampling frequency value. Next, we shall compare the DFT with the continuous Fourier transform. As we said before, the spectrum x of k is the spectrum of the periodic repetition of x of n. Thus, if x of n is periodic in the block size n that we have sampled it with, then x of k is an exact representation of the spectrum. That is, it gives the, Fourier co the coefficients of the Fourier series. If x of n is a transient shorter than the length n of data, that is, the transient dies out within the measurement time, then x of k is actually equal to the continuous Fourier transform x of f at the frequencies fk equal to k times delta f. And finally, if x of n is a general continuous function or a transient and the transient length is longer than the measurement time, then there will be an error. So x of k is not identical to the true spectrum x of f, but it is an approximation. As we said earlier, the error that occurs in case 3 in the previous slide is called leakage. So the spectrum then that we can call x sub w, the windowed spectrum, is not the correct spectrum. Rather, the spectrum is the, re the convolution of the true spectrum x of f and a window function w of f, where the window so far 
in our description here is the boxcar due to the truncation of the time signal as we indicated earlier. If we use this rectangular window then the function w of f, the Fourier transform of the window time function, is typically a sine x over x. The leakage effect you can see here. If you take a sign which does not have an, uh, uh, an integer number of periods, so it doesn't end up in the measurement time, this leads to leakage, which is seen here by a peak which is lower than what it should be, a factor of one. It has, and the energy that is lacking here has leaked out to adjacent frequencies, hence the name of the phenomenon. We will now look at the convolution of the window and the true spectrum and you will see how it works for a, a pure sine wave. So first for a sine which has a frequency coinciding with a frequency line, we will see in the next slide what the leakage effect will be. Second, we will look at the other case where this, the true frequency is right in the middle of two frequency lines. So, you remember that convolution means that we mirror one of the functions that we want to convolve. Let's mirror the window spectrum. We don't see any difference because the window Fourier spectrum is symmetric. So this is the mirrored Fourier transform of the window. Note that the x, x, y axis here is logarithmic, it's in dB. In the figure here now, we have shifted the mirrored window spectrum back to k equals minus 10. So this will produce the, a frequency line at this position. Of course, we should shift it all the way back to minus n half, but this is just to get the point here. Now, as you can see soon, when we animate all the steps from minus 10 up to plus 10, you will see what the, what the uh, multiplication or the convolution between these two results in. You should particularly see that the spectrum has zeros at each integer k here. So when we have shifted it 10 steps to the left here, the true spectrum of the sign, which is located here at zero, is coinciding with a zero of the window function. We now see what happens when we step it up through the different values for eight, minus seven, minus six, and so on. Now, you should see when we enter the main lobe here, here, that we get a value separate from zero. But all the other products are zero and of course the sum of zero is zero. So here is the end result. All the values from minus 10 to plus 10 are zero except for the one value which coincided with the main lobe. This is the result when we have no leakage. The DFT produces a correct frequency spectrum. Next we will look at the other case when the true sign lies right in between two frequency bins as indicated here. The frequency of the sign here is at 0.5, right in between two integer case. We do the same with the window, we mirror it and send it back to minus 10 and then we look at the products and here you should note that we write on a side lobe of the window function. So. Here is the result of each of the products of these two functions. And you see that we get a significant value for each time step k. And here is the final result. You see we have two values in the middle with, which are too low they should be up here at zero, but they are down here. And then we have many 
values which are significantly different from zero. This is the leakage effect. Now, the illustration of the convolution of the true spectrum and the Fourier transform of the window in the previous couple of slides was easy because the true spectrum was only one single frequency line. For real signals, however, the convolution result will be more com complicated, of course, uh, as also frequencies in the true spectrum away from the current frequency bin will be contribu uh, contributing to the convolution result. If the side lobes are reasonably low compared to the main lobe, another approximation can be made by only counting the contribution from the main lobe. Doing this results in an interpretation shown here uh, where you can call it a parallel filter bank with bandpass filters for each frequency result. You can see it as a bandpass filter filtering out the information ar around the frequency line of interest. Since this somehow resembles at uh, looking at the true spectrum through a fence, this is called the picket fence effect. This way of looking at the DFT result is particularly useful for two purposes. First, if you want to know the maximum error in estimating the amplitude, or if you want the RMS level of a single sign, you can read the value right in the cross point of two bandpass filters. This from up here, where is one, down here, it's the maximum attenuation that a sign at this location will get. So the maximum error if you try to measure a sign amplitude. Second, to understand the effect of the DFT on a broadband signal, that is a signal with continuous spectrum, such as a random signal, it's easy to see these effects by thinking of the picket fence effect. So this is another very important view of the DFT. Now that we understand the leakage effect, we can try to improve the DFT result for some particular purpose we have with our analysis. And this is done by applying a time window other than the rectangular window we have talked about so far. So before the DFT is computed, we multiply the measured data by a function as indicated in the upper right plot here. And this we call a time window. The product of this time window and the data uh, in the lower left plot here is what we actually send to the DFT. And the result of this is shown in the lower right plot in, with the solid line, the narrower and lower value here. Now this doesn't look like it's more accurate than the leakage, the, the, um, the rectangular window up here, but it actually is. The error here is only caused by an amplitude scaling error that we will see in the next slide that we can easily get rid of. So the fact that this windowed spectrum is more narrow is what the, the advantage we want here. So the amplitude error we get, the effect here is very easy to find out if we define simply a, uh, uh, a signal, which is a simple complex uh, sign. So we define x of k or x sub k of n as a times e to j2 pi fkt equals to a times e to j2 pi k n over n for a particular k. The DFT then becomes uh, A times the sum of WN, the, the time window, times E to J2 pi K N over N, the measurement signal, times the Fourier transform exponential, E to minus J2 pi K N over N. And of course, these two exponentials, they cancel out. So what remains is A times the sum of the window values. Now, we already divide the DFT result by n. So in order to get a scaling constant that will work to produce a 
reasonable value of the DFT, we define a scaling factor such as is indicated here, as n divided by the sum of the window values. Now, with this definition of A sub w, a scaled DFT result is obtained by taking A divided by n times the measured signal times a window and then the DFT of this. If, n, if f x of n then is a cosine with amplitude a corresponding to a particular frequency, let's say k, then we will get two values out of the DFT. We will get x sub w of k and x sub w of n minus k, and both these values will be a half. Now, there are very many time windows in literature, but it is quite enough with two windows for vibration analysis purposes. So what we typically use for vibration analysis is the standard all round window, the Henning window, which is simply a sine square, or if you want, one half times one minus a cosine. The other window we need is a special window useful for periodic signals, which we call the flat top window, which is composed of four different cosines plus a DC value. Now the coefficients for these, the AK coefficients here, you can find in the book. Here you see the three windows then, the two actual windows in the, the middle and the lower plot, and then the rectangular window, which we get if we do not apply one of the other windows. On the right hand side, you see the plots of the spectra of each of them. And if we start by looking at the rectangular window, sometimes called the boxcar window, uh, the, uh, the uh, frequency spectrum of it is characterized by a narrow main lobe which has a first zero at k equal one as we have seen before and k equal minus one and then we have zeros for each integer of the of k the henning window has a broader main lobe the main lobe er uh, zeros are at minus two and plus two so that means that there are three non-zero values in the main lobe for k equals minus one, zero, and plus one. Finally, uh, you can also see for the, uh, for the uh, Hanning window that the side lobes are lower and falls off at a faster rate than for the rectangular window. Then we have the flat top window, which has a very broad or wide main lobe and very low side lobes, lower than 90, minus 90 dB. The first zeros are at k equals minus five and plus five. So there are nine non-zero values in the main lobe for k equals minus four, minus three and so on up to plus four. If you make the thought experiment now of the convolution of the true spectrum with the Fourier transform of the window, like we did for the rectangular window earlier, you will find the following results. In the left plot, we see the effect of a handing window and a flat up window when the sign is exactly on a frequency bin and that we don't have any leakage. The result of the rectangular window is not included, but we know from the animation uh, earlier on that that would only produce one value, the true value of one. The Henning result here is actually three non-zero values. And these come, come from the fact that the main lobe of the Henning window contained three values for minus one, k equal minus one, zero and plus one. For the case with a flat top window in green, 
we actually have many more values that are non-zero. Actually, we have nine of them for k equals minus four, minus three, and all the way up to plus four. In the right-hand plot, we see the effects of when we have leakage. So when the frequency is right in between two frequency lines. And here you also see the rectangular window result. And you see that although the amplitude becomes better with the Hanning window, it's still in error. Actually, it's 16% error. Whereas the flat uh, window results in a, an almost accurate result. The error here is only within 0.1%. But we also see the other not so good effect. The better the amplitude accuracy gets, the broader the peak is. This leads to a frequency resolution limitation, as in real life there could be several signs close inside this main lobe. So we have a trade-off between amplitude accuracy and frequency resolution which we always have in frequency analysis applications. Finally, a few words about circular convolution and zero padding. Sometimes we want to uh, produce a convolution result in the time domain by multiplying two spectra in the frequency domain and then inverse transforming back to the time domain. If we do that, however, just using normal DFT results, we get something called cyclic correlation that you should look for in the book. But there is a simple trick to avoid this, and this trick is called zero padding. What we do is simply we fill up the data sequence X of N with as many zeros as X of N contains values. So we make it double the size, but we only extend it with zeros, thus the name zero padding. This leads to a true convolution when we bring the product in the frequency domain back to the time domain. And you should look at example 931 in the book to explore this. Now, zero padding is sometimes used by some people also for spectrum analysis. And I want to stress that this should not be done. This was a recommended procedure early on in the days of FFT, but it is not very good to do this. And the reason is that the spectrum estimate does never becomes better using zero padding, but there is a risk that it becomes worse. So avoid zero padding when you do spectrum analysis only use it to ensure true, cor cor uh, uh, true convolution. This concludes the current lecture. Now you can go to the book and read the uh, relevant chapter and uh, work through the examples at the end of the uh, chapter. Then you should also go to the chapter examples in the Abravibe toolbox and read through these and run them and make sure that you understand all the steps involved. If you haven't yet downloaded the toolbox, you sh should do so at www.abravive.com. Welcome back to the next lecture when you have worked through this.